Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if you're planning on doing any traveling, go to johnnydollarair.com uh, first. If you find the best deal there, uh, and johnnydollarair.com is Priceline, if you find the best deal there and opt to uh, book, it actually does help to support the show. So when making your travel plans, go to johnnydollarair.com. Well, now we begin the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar uh, programs. And... Uh, we're starting right at the beginning. The, the two episodes we're going to listen to today aired October the 3rd and October the 4th of 1955. So, after uh, years of requesting, uh, we're finally bringing it to you. Here is Bob Bailey and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Father Taggart. I'm calling you from Ossining. I'm one of the chaplains here at Sing Sing. Oh, yes, sir. What can I do for you, Father? Well, nothing for me, Mr. Dollar, but possibly for someone else. Michael Cairn, one of our inmates, asked me to contact you. Michael Cairn? Mm-hmm. You remember him? He wasn't sure you would. Old-time grifter and con man who got tied up with an insurance fraud a few years ago, blonde fella? Yes. Well, Michael wants to see you, Mr. Dollar. Could you possibly find the time to come up here? Oh, well, I don't know, Father. Is this something important? It is to Michael. Oh, well, uh, look, I'll be in New York sometime next month. Maybe I'll get a chance to stop off. Well, couldn't you possibly make it sooner? What's the rush? He's going to be there quite a while, isn't he? Not very long, I'm afraid. Michael is dying. All right, Father, you can expect me. Welcome to Johnny Dollar. Beginning tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Ed Barth, Controller's Office. This is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Though you didn't authorize the investigation, Ed, I'm sure that once the facts are out, you will honor the following. Expense account, item one, $7.95. Train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Austin, New York. I was admitted inside the prison and greeted by Father Taggart. He's a tall, mild-looking man, a Jesuit, I believe. He had a pass all ready for me, and he led me straight to the prison infirmary. Just in here. Michael will certainly appreciate your coming, Mr. Dollar. I hope it satisfies whatever's on his mind. I can't imagine what it would be. You know it was my investigation and testimony that put him in here, Father. He told me all about that, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with why he wants to see you. See, his lungs started to go about two years ago, and there's just been no way to arrest the condition. Does he know how close he is? Oh, yes. And he's not afraid to die. Here we are, Mr. Dollar. Oh. What? Hardly the same man I remember, Father. He's had it bad lately. Lost a great deal of weight. Yeah. Asleep? Yes. Michael. Michael! Oh. Hey, Father. I brought someone to see you. What do you say? Hiya, Mike. Oh. (laughs) Thanks for coming. Thanks, Johnny. Thank Father Taggart here. Yeah. He's an all right guy, Johnny. It's just like you. I always said you were the best insurance cop. <coughs> here, here, what's all this? I'm kicking out, Johnny. Didn't you tell him, Father? He told me, Mike. 
In case I didn't live right. I'll be back in a little while. Thanks, Father. You take it easy, Mike. Mm. <laughs> a lousy place to die, prison. But I ain't got my choice, thanks to you. Well, it's just that you picked to do a couple of things that the law and some insurance companies didn't agree with, Mike. Uh, I don't hold none of that against you. The guy does what he does. I, I don't know how to tell you this. <laughs> Maybe I better get the doctor. You shouldn't be talking so much. No, no, wait. Johnny, look, you know I'm no crybaby. When the doctor gave me the news, I, I got to thinking. I ain't scared to blow out, you understand? I know, Mike, I know. You know it's just that I had a wife once, a long time ago when I started out. Oh? Yeah. Then I just kind of drifted out of her picture one day. And <coughs> ain't got a cough drop, baby. <laughs> yeah, I guess it wouldn't cure what I got. Anyhow, I, I got to do something for her before I... Well, Johnny, I lay here and I get myself an idea. Yeah, Mike? Johnny, if there was some real easy money lying around, would you pick it up for me? Depends on how clean it is, Mike, and where it's lying. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It, it, well, it's clean, all right. You can find that out for yourself. All right. Now, now listen. Till they moved me down here in the infirmary, I roomed upstairs with Jojo Panny. You know him? No, don't believe I do. And Carthy from the Hay States. He got his sabbatical three weeks ago. Paroled. Uh-huh. Well, I've been in the camp with a lot of guys, but Jojo Penny <laughs> takes the cake. He's got a little old five-year trick to put in. <laughs> this Jojo, he does it like a vacation. You know, a real picnic. <laughs> Every time he gets a chance out in the yard, he's taking sun. So he don't get the color, see? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when they push him in with me, I notice this. And I get to going over in my head. Yeah. Why does a guy whistle in a cell block, Johnny? Why, why is he treating it like a rest home? Short term. He's got something outside waiting. <sighs> That's it, baby. He's got something waiting for him outside. Something that he knows will keep safe. Money. Thought you said this was legitimate, Mike. <sighs> it is, it is. Now, wait. I didn't ask Jojo anything about this. No, I figured it out myself. Then a couple of times I hear him yelling in his sleep. McCormick, he yells. McCormick. Eh? Make sense now, Johnny? Not yet. Ah, the big heist, Johnny, the big heist. A few years ago, a rich guy named McCormick out on Long Island or someplace like that gets turned over for $100,000 worth of jewelry. You remember? Vaguely. Eh, well, I'm thinking that Jojo Panny was in on it somewhere. Mm. Else why would he be singing and whistling and chilling himself around this fly trap for five years? Else why would he be talking about that when he's sleeping? McCormick. McCormick. Yeah. Maybe you've got something, Mike. Ah, I know I got something, Johnny. And you got something, too. It... <laughs> oh, no, Mike. Take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Don't you see? The insurance company must have a reward out. They always do. A reward. Yeah, but Mike, look. I tell you, Joe Joe is the Ginzo that done the job. Or he knows who did it. So, you look into it. Work on it. Maybe turn up the stuff and get the reward. Good clean coin. Yeah. Yeah. Send half of it to my old lady, will you? You keep the rest yourself. What'd you say? Huh? Will you? Mike Kern died three hours later. The last living thing he did was wink at me. Expense account item two, $14.20. Train fare and incidentals, Ossining to New York. I arrived at 2.15, dropped my bag off at the New Western, and went over to the Metropolitan Police Station to find out what I could about the McCormick matter. It was all pretty much as old Mike had told me. A Julian McCormick living on Long Island had suffered a $100,000 jewelry burglary in 1951. Twelve suspects had been arrested and released. The case was marked open and unsolved. Allied Casualty had been the insurance company involved. This is the adjustment office. Frank Porter speaking. My name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Porter. I'm an investigator. Oh, I think I've heard of you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Wonder if you could give me a little information about a claim your company handled in 1951. A man named Julian McCormick out on Long Island. 
Jeep with a long time ago. Uh, what about the McCormick claim? I might have some information on it. I don't know yet. It's a long chance. I'm at police headquarters, and I notice you investigated for the insurance company. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, sure, but it's kind of late today. Tomorrow, okay? Well, you can tell me this right now. Is there any reward being offered? Gee whiz, kind of falls my sails. How's that? Well, asking about a reward. Uh, you sound like you can make full recovery and want to make sure that you'll be paid for it. Well, I said it was just a long shot. How about the reward? Well, that's pretty standard with us on cases like this. Yeah, I think it's 7500 or something like that. I'm not sure. Where are you staying? New Weston. Well, I'll look it up, get the exact figure, and call you there. How'll that be? Fine, thanks. That'll be fine. Before I left the police station, I turned out a mug on Jojo Panny. He was a big, broad-shouldered lad with plenty of beef and a list of petty convictions, four of them in New York State. The last one was for carrying concealed weapons... His parole status was good, though, and the parole officer furnished me with his home address. The Allen Hotel, rates day, week, or month, 115th Street. It's open, it's open. Come on in. Hiya. Looking for Joe Penn. Yes, sir. That's me. My name's Johnny Dollar. Yeah? I, uh, I just came down from Ossining. I saw a friend of yours up there, Joe. Who was that? Mike Cairn. How's Mike? Not so good. He died today. Uh, it's too bad. He was a nice old coot. Kind of liked him. Said if I ever saw you to say hello. Uh-huh. He didn't give you my address. No, I got it from the parole office. You some kind of cop? No, I work for an insurance company. Oh. Buy you a drink? Sure. Why not? Expense account, item three, four dollars even for drinks. I wanted to look at Joe Joe Panny and talk to him and figure out how I was going to go about getting information from him. And the more I saw and the more he talked, the more I wondered if whatever he might have said about the McCormick case in his sleep happened to some other McCormick. After all, a man with a long list of petty thieveries is hardly ever involved in a slick, big-time safe-cracking job. That takes another kind of talent, and one I was sure that Joe Joe didn't have. So i just been taking it easy and looking around. I figure I can get a job pushing a truck or maybe a cab if I'm lucky. Got to get something to do. Parole officer's kind of hard-nosed about things like that. Yeah. Drink up. Want one more? Oh, no, no thanks. Freeze my limit. Like to keep in shape. Sure. Say, uh, you got anything to do? Nothing special. Why? Thought I might go out to Long Island later on tonight to say hello to an old friend of mine. If you haven't got anything to do, come on along. <laughs> You're okay, bub. Sure, why not? Uh, this friend of yours, he's an ex-con too? No, he never did any time. Just a friend. Want to say hello is all. Oh. Rich fella. His name's Julian McCormick. You're, uh... Very big with the hellos around here today, aren't you? Anything wrong, Joe? You probably are. Why do you say that? Nothing. Ever know anyone named McCormick? I knew a guy named Arnie McCormick once back in Salt Lake City. We were pals for a while. Oh. Yeah. Arnie was killed in the war. He'd got himself drafted in the infantry. Maybe he's related to my friend Julian McCormick out on Long Island. He wasn't related to anybody, not that bird. I'm leaving. I want to get up early tomorrow. Why not come with me? <laughs> Thanks for the drinks. He drifted off down the street and left me standing there. And one thing I was sure of, he had the name McCormick on his mind. Whether it was the right McCormick or the right case, I didn't know. Anyhow, he was my one big lead. So I was back at his hotel early the next morning and talking to the desk clerk. Annie, did you say room 210? Yeah, that's right. Vamoose. What? He left bag and baggage last night. Well, where did he go? What's his forwarding address? He didn't say. Just left. <laughs> Johnny. 
Sonny Dollar. Uh, this is Frank Porter, Allied Casualties. Yes, Mr. Porter. Well, call me Frank, Johnny. Uh, you phoned yesterday about the McCormick matter. I got all the stuff about the case on my desk here. Uh, we're still offering $7,500 reward. Thanks for confirming it, Frank. Sure. Uh, you got a tip or something? An old con named Mike Cairn gave me a tip about a guy named Jojo Panny. I'm working on it. Need any help? No, not yet. I might. Jojo pulled out of his hotel last night, bag and baggage. Oh, what are you going to do? I'm on my way to Long Island. Huh? I want to talk to McCormick himself. Oh. Uh, Johnny. Yeah? Let me give you a tip for your own good. Don't bother Julian McCormick unless you've really got something. Could be dangerous. I think I've got something. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Item four, $10 deposit on the car I rented to drive out to Julian McCormick's home on Long Island. And judging by the looks of the place, a safe full of $100,000 worth of jewelry would feel right at home. It was a mansion, and the rugs on the floor were an inch thick. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting. Mrs. McCormick and I were packing for a little trip to Europe. Sit down, please. Thanks. Going to be gone long? Oh, we usually spend several months a year over there. We're a bit late this year. Our reservations are for next week. I envy you, Mr. McCormick. Dollar the name? That's right. Forgive me, but I don't seem to recall having heard of you before. Oh, that's okay. We never met. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, really? Am I being investigated or something? No, no, nothing like that. It's just that I might have a lead on that jewelry that was taken from your home a few years ago. Well, that's wonderful. You must tell me about it. Can I make you a drink? No, thanks. You're from the insurance company. Allied casualty? No, no, I'm not. I'm an independent investigator. Well, why should anyone feel it necessary to call in a... Oh, oh, I see. There's a reward, of course. That's right. Yes, of course. But now, tell me... How can I help you? Well, I'm just checking a few things, Mr. McCormick. I haven't even gone over it with a man who handled the case for Allied. Possibly I have run into something that'll help. I don't know. I'd like you to tell me what happened. My safe was opened and my jewelry taken. I mean, how it happened. Well, it was right in this very room. That's the wall safe there. Uh Uh-huh. Mrs. McCormick and I had just returned from our honeymoon. Five years ago, it was. Yeah? All I know is that when I stepped into the library here that morning, the safe was open and everything was gone. Whoever did it was extremely clever and quiet, I must say. Was the safe cracked? No, no, no. It was just opened. Someone figured the combination or something like that. Well, who knew the combination at the time? Only myself, Mr. Dolan. You sure of that? Why, of course. I see. I reported it to the police right away here on Long Island. Then some men from New York City were here, too. And your insurance company? I reported it to my insurance company immediately. They had a man on the scene as soon as the police. A uh, Mr. Porter. Frank Porter? Yes. Do you know him? I've talked to him on the phone. I haven't met him. A very nice chap. He worked very hard trying to recover it. I'm sure he did. Did they have an adjuster? Yes. Uh, how much did you collect, if you don't mind? Not much. What do you mean? Well, it was unfortunate. By keeping that much jewelry in a small house safe, it seems I violated the clause in the contract. It should have been kept in a safety deposit box or some such. Consequently, the matter went into litigation. I'm afraid the court found me at fault. I collected only a part of the insured value, $20,000. So, you can see, I'd certainly welcome a recovery. Sure. The jewelry was in the family a good many years. I had given it to my wife, and I... Well, a man hates to lose things he loves. Yes, I understand. Was Mrs. McCormick here the morning it happened? Oh, yeah? I'd like to talk to her. She's terribly busy, but if you think it's sufficiently important, I'll call her. No, never mind. I'm curious, Mr. Dollar. This case has been closed a long time. At least... No one's contacted me or asked me for any information about it for at least four years. What opened it? A man named Mike Cairn. Huh? Who's he? An old convict up at Ossining who shared a cell for a while with a man named Joe Panny. Uh Uh-huh. Cairn died yesterday, but before he died, he told me he thought Panny had something to do with it. He'd heard him mention your name. Well, it seems to me you should talk with this Joe Panny. I did, and I will some more. 
As soon as I locate him again. Right now, he's missing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thanks for the time, Mr. McCormick. You let me know if you learn anything? Sure. Do you honestly think you can recover that jewelry? With any luck at all. That would be wonderful, wonderful. You think so? Why, yes, of course. Mrs. McCormick might be glad to know about it, too. Huh? You said it was her jewelry. I don't know why I said that to him. Just a sudden impulse. But he wasn't smiling when he walked me to the door, shook my hand, and patted me on the shoulder. I had a funny feeling that Mr. Julian McCormick was scared like a rabbit of me. I drove back to the city, had lunch at Walgreens, and dropped into Allied Casualties, New York office, to pick up the folder on reward information. I met Frank Porter and liked him right away, a big red-headed man in a tweed suit. Well, gee whiz, Johnny, it makes me feel older than ever doing this. How come? Well, I weighed 15 pounds less when this case started, June 1931. Ah, here we are. Uh, these are pictures of the stuff. Uh-huh. Now, that one they call Tierra del Fuego. Huh? Some necklace, hmm? I can see why. Yeah, and uh, this one was called Imperial, in the royal family of Russia at one time. And uh, this is the other one, Placid. Mm, beautiful stuff. Oh, you can say that again. That all of it? Well, that's about the size of it, Johnny. One hundred thousand dollars gone. Yeah. Help any? Sure. It's nice to know what I'm trying to find. Well, I hope you have better luck than I did. Yeah. Say, uh, who was the police officer on the case? Uh, Martin. Duels Martin. Out of Central? Yeah. We ran down every lead we could find, big and small. The file said you made 12 arrests. Yeah, something like that, but not one of them panned out. Had to let them all go. Martin requested pickups on every big-time jewelry man in the country. Now, I don't think one of them was overlooked. Well... No, Johnny, somebody just simply walked in that house, opened the safe as neat as you please, and walked right out with all of this. Very slick job. Had to be an experienced man. Well, might have been a first job for someone just starting in. He got lucky. Yeah, we thought of that, and we didn't think much of it after a while. Thank you. Gee whiz, Johnny, you know, nobody could be that lucky. Case the house, know exactly where the safe was, know what was in it, get in, open it up, and get out without anybody, servants, the McCormicks, or any of their friends even seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that wasn't even the hardest part, you see. Not one scrap of this stuff has ever turned up anywhere. Yeah, well, Anywhere. Now, what, a, what did whoever took it do with it? Did he break it down, sell it overseas? What? Not a trace of it. Imagine that. Imagine. You know what I think? I think the guy who swiped all this stuff still has it. I think he's sitting around waiting for it to cool off. Could be. Uh... But it's never going to cool off, Johnny. There isn't a city in this country or across the ocean that isn't on the lookout for these pieces. I suppose. Now, sooner or later, hot boy or lucky boy, well, whoever he is, will make a move. <laughs> Meantime, we just wait. Unless, of course, uh, you've got something for us to look into. Uh, not yet, Frank. Yeah, well, when you have, we'll be right with you all the way. Good, good. How about a drink? Uh, take a rain check. Okay. But remember, we got a whole floor full of lawyers upstairs. They can get up warrants, writs, seizure orders, anything you might want. Yeah. You just let me know when you get somewhere and we'll go to work. I'll do that, Frank. <laughs> I left Frank Porter and went back over to the parole office to see what had developed with Joe Panny. After all, if he didn't report in, he'd be in violation of his parole, be in real trouble. But nothing had developed. He hadn't put in a change of address, nothing. So I went back to my hotel and had some dinner. Then I shaved, changed my clothes. Expense account, item five, dollar and a half, cab fare. I garaged my rented car, went back to Central Police Station and pulled out the mug on Joe Panny once more. Hoping to get a line on some friends or relatives of his where he might be staying. Up till then, things had been going pretty routine. Then a clerk from the parole offices stepped across the hall. Hi, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Thought it was you I saw in here. I wasn't sure. How's it going? Fine, fine. Talk to your friend Joe Joe Panny yet? Not today. Why? Well, you seemed awful anxious to talk to him, is all. I am. <laughs> Why don't you go see him? You playing games? I've been trying to find out where he is all day. And I already told you. You what? Sure, I gave it to you half an hour ago when you phoned. When who phoned? Sure, about half an hour ago. Look, Joe Panny called in and told me his address. Yeah? I no sooner set down a phone and you call in and said, this is Johnny Dollar. Have you heard from Joe Panny? Why? I said, yeah, and I told you his address. That's all. What address did you say? The Allen Hotel on 115th Street. Same place he was before. What's the matter? You forget? <laughs> It took me ten minutes to get from the police station over to the Allen Hotel. Ten minutes of wondering who'd put in that call and use my name. I went up the stairs, two at a time, up to the second floor. 
And right at the top of the landing, I bumped into a dark-haired woman wearing a silver fur piece. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see you. It's all right. You hurt? No, not at all. Please, let me go past. I'm in a hurry. Yeah, I'd be in a hurry, too. What do you mean? The gun. What? You should carry it on the inside of your purse. Oh, I didn't... Suppose I take it. No, let go of me. You... Fingernails, huh? Give it to me. All right, take it. She'd given it to me, all right, right on the side of the head. It didn't knock me out, but it did knock me off balance, so I tangled up with a hall table. And that gave her plenty of time to scurry down the stairs while I got out of the furniture and back on my feet. By the time I got down the stairs and out on the street, she was nowhere in sight. Hmm. No one yelled, I'm shot. No one did anything but what they were already doing. Hi. Where were you just now? You weren't here at the front desk. I was out back eating my dinner. Why? Oh, nothing. You happen to see that woman who just ran through here? No. Tall, dark-haired woman, about 30, wore a mixed stole. Me? Yeah. Oh, you're kidding. In this joint... You still looking for Joe Panny? He lives here again, doesn't he? Yeah. Have you seen him? Where is he? Out. I sat down with myself and waited. A half an hour later, when the clerk went back to finish his dinner, I stepped over to the desk and borrowed his pass key and went back up the stairs to room 210. I didn't need the passkey, and I didn't need to doubt the clerk. Joe Panny wasn't there. But all of his things were. The curtains were drawn and the windows closed. Every drawer had been pulled out of every dresser. The mattress on the bed was slipped from top to bottom, and the rug had been ripped and turned over. (laughs) Expense account, item six, one dollar, one drink. From me. I left JoJo's room, went to the nearest bar, sat down, and had a drink. A scared victim, a missing con, a dark-haired woman wearing a mink and a gun, and other things. Right then and there, I decided that Mike Cann's tip had been pretty good at that. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, a slight case of mayhem. When the right guy turns up in the wrong place. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Well, we will see uh, and follow up on the missing convict on Wednesday. So uh, join us for the third part of that one. Definitely off to a really strong start. Well, we now do turn to listener comments and feedback. And uh, we start off with uh, Bill, who says, Johnny Dollar is my favorite. Uh, Patrick uh, commented, and with agreement from Bobby as well, uh, John Long grew on me. He was a very good uh, Johnny Dollar. Why did he leave the show at that time? What happened uh, to his career after the show ended? Thanks, Adam. Well, thanks, Patrick. And this is probably something I should have addressed a couple Fridays ago, but 
better late than never. Uh, what happened to him after um, yours uh, tr- uh, truly, Johnny Dollar? Or I guess we'll start with why did he uh, leave? Um, with most of these radio programs, it's usually not the actor's uh, decision. In this case, CBS at this point um, was kind of uh, pulling back from its um, uh, from its uh, a lot of its crime drama programs, and the the shows it had running in the 1954 season uh, that it was looking at. Uh, were things like Mr. Keen Tracer of Lost Persons and Mr. and Mrs. North with a strong appeal to a female audience. Um, so it was more of that. Uh, in terms of John Lund's career, uh, he continued uh, to act for uh, several years. He didn't, for whatever reason, he didn't, he never got into television acting, but he did continue to appear in uh, movies. Uh, last one being in 1962, and then he officially uh, retired uh, in 1963 to focus on running um, uh, on running his uh, local um, uh, local businesses. Before he retired, he did a lot of radio as well. Uh, and for those of you who have the premium site, we've played some episodes of Suspense. He did up into the late 1950s. Um, uh, but, you know, overall, he actually, even though his performance career was uh, somewhat uh, cut short, he basically retired at the age of uh, 52. He had a pretty good life. Uh, married to the same woman for nearly 50 years. He lived to the ripe old age of 81 and uh, apparently enjoyed uh, success after Hollywood. So a pretty good outcome, uh, particularly with the uh, challenges of Hollywood in the era and even just the amount of uh, smoking. He did very well to live uh, that long and actually was the last uh, yours truly Johnny Dollar star to pass away nearly 30 years after the show went off the air. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us tomorrow for the adventures of frank race and then be sure and listen to doors truly john johnny dollar on wednesday as the mccormick matter continues send your comments to box 13 at greatdetectives.net follow us on twitter radio detectives and uh, become one of our friends on facebook facebook.com slash radio detectives but uh, from boise idaho this is your host adam graham signing off